Here we are together again, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Anne. Welcome, Anne. Hi, Thomas. Thomas is with us as well. Where can I find these comments that just went away? There we go. Caroline is with us. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Adrian. Uh, Adrian is with us. Uh, evidently, I'm with us too. Thomas is here. Ron, morning, Ron. Uh, who else is with us? Anne, that's good. Peggy's joining us. Caroline is with us. Uh, you know where to tune in now, Caroline? Uh, it's just these Tuesday Talk Lives, you just stay on this page and they turn you know, themselves over. Uh, Kim is with us also from Sugar Valley, Georgia. Good. Everybody's signing in. Sometimes I, I heard that I start too quickly, that uh, people still signing in and they miss the beginning of it. Uh, everyone, can you hear me? Uh, have one person, Aksa, says she can't hear you. Unmute your screen. I see I have audio levels. We're doing good. It's Tuesday Talk Live again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Nancy from SoCal. Guy is with us from St. Pete. Uh, Bob Dudley's with us. Carla as well. Michael Bernard, all our favorite people. Uh, today we're going to talk about the arch enemy of brown and crispy. I'll introduce you to the arch enemy of brown and crispy. And here's a question that was thrown at me this week. How do you cook if you don't have a sense of taste? One of the best questions I've ever gotten. I had to think about it for a while. And of course, we'll be examining the Carefree Cooks Gallery again today to see what was going on in our Carefree Cooks community over the past week. We're live again because it's Tuesday at noon. I see Rebecca is with us and Anne and Mary has joined us as well. That's great. Good to see all these names. Cheryl is with us. Cool. Everybody checking in. But look, if it's not Tuesday around noon and you're watching this, it probably isn't live. So you want to make sure that you go go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and uh, register for my instant alert system so that 15 minutes before I go live, I'll send this out. This will become uh, more and more important as we do more and more of these lives and we start cooking together and all these things that we're going to do in the future. So make sure you're part of that alert system, webcookingclasses.com slash live because we're all carefree cooks. We love to hang out together. And how do we differentiate ourselves from other cooks out there? Just the the plain old cooks. <laughs> We're carefree cooks, right? We create our own recipes, which brings family and friends together. We learn every time we cook. This develops a cooking style because we practice pro methods and we love our cooking. That's why we're different as a community. We're carefree cooks and other people aren't. <laughs> We've discovered something new, right? We're having a lot of fun with it. I love looking into our community. I'm there every day. You know, if I don't like or comment or reply, please know that, that there are just so many hundreds of emails and comments and suggestions and being tagged coming at me. I try and get to them as many as possible, but I do see your stuff. I'm there lurking, watching everybody's progress. And you know, the great thing about our community is most of the time I don't need to answer some of these questions or adjust some of these questions because as much experience as I have as a single person at being not, not single, of course, my beloved wife, Heather, but as a one person, um, that's one opinion. But when you're in our Carefree Cooks community, you, you ask a question and you get 10 different people tell you 10 different things. It's exciting. You know, the different ways to do it because really there is no one answer to it. Uh, unless, of course, we're playing the true or false. And I got a true or false again for you this week. Is this statement true or false? Once something is defrosted, it cannot be refrozen. Okay? Once you take something out of your freezer and defrost it, you cannot put it back in. That's the true and false. True or false for this Tuesday Talk Live. We'll get to the answer at the bottom. So tell me in the chat box, true or false on our true or false this week. Uh, who else? Laura is joining us. Adrienne is here as well. Adiolu is here. Welcome. I hope I got your name. Edward Smith is joining us. Linda is here. Kevin, Bill, uh, Reginald. Wow, a lot of people. It's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, look, I'm getting a lot of questions this week about uh, why my items don't brown. Okay, the Chef Todd, I got this one in particular that set me off. Chef Todd, I have, uh, I'm cooking chicken and I uh, used, the, the, she described this person, I think it was a she, she described the chicken, she described the parts, she described how she broke the chicken down, um, then she put the chicken in the pan and like the whole thing and the chicken didn't get brown. The Chef Todd, how come my chicken didn't get brown? Did I use the wrong kind of chicken? Should I not 
use chicken? Does chicken not get brown? <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, did I use the method? Did I? And they're like all these questions. And today, what I really want to do is introduce you to the enemy. <laughs> I want to introduce you to the enemy of brown and crispy. This is the guy right here. Oh, by the way, extra points. Does anybody know what this character's name is? Tell me in the chat box if you know the name of this character. And bonus points, because when you Google Arch Enemy, this is what comes up, this image. And bonus points if you can tell me what he was in, okay? Name and what he was in. Nonetheless, we're gonna use this guy as the arch enemy of brown and crispy because when I get questions about my chicken doesn't get brown or I get questions about how long should I cook the item until it gets brown, uh, how big should the item be if I want it to get brown, uh, coating it in fat so that it gets brown. There's just so many things that people think and the arch enemy of brown and crispy is not only this guy, but it's very, very simple. It's moisture. It doesn't matter the pan. It doesn't matter the chicken. It doesn't matter so many things if you don't pat the chicken dry. If you don't dry your item first, it is never gonna get brown. Or at least, I shouldn't say never. It will get brown, but it will be so far beyond cooked and stiffened and tough uh, that it, you won't care that it's brown because it'll be inedible. And this goes back to the four effects of heat on food that we've talked about before, right? So. It, it, all of cooking comes down to the effects of heat on food. And two weeks ago, we talked about the difference between conductive and convective heat, right? It was a, a segment that we called, um, should I turn the convection fan on or not? Something like that, convection fan on or off. I, by the way, have a piece of black electrical tape that I put over the regular button on my oven. I always use the convection. But look, we've talked about that before. So we've talked about applying heat indirectly or directly. Here's the next element that you need to really be a skillful cook and have things come out the way that you want them to. Not only do you need to consider direct and indirect, but you need to consider dry and moist because moist cooking and dry cooking give you dramatically different results. So that if you were to poach chicken, right? If you were to steam chicken, uh, uh, the second part of braising chicken, uh, uh, simmering chicken, uh, any of these things, you know that when you cook something in wetness, it's gonna look really, really bland, right? Like this, this is a, a steamed chicken, an entire steamed chicken, steamed and then, whoops, cut into pieces. So why is it that something that is cooked in moisture will never get brown? Why is it that when you have so much moisture on your piece of chicken and then you put it in the oven, the oven fills with steam? The, the first, one of the first things on the four effects of heat on food is the evaporation of moisture. So if you fill your oven with steam from your wet chicken, you are not gonna get to the caramelization of sugars. And we've talked about this before. So let's again talk about wet versus dry and direct versus indirect. These are the two most important considerations in cooking if you wanna cook by method. So all of our web cooking classes students, because in week one, one of the very first things, once we check the truthfulness of your oven, we talk about the four effects of heat on food. And they are like this, at 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 degrees Celsius, uh, it's gen uh, gelatinization of starches. Starches absorb liquids and swell. You know this if you've ever made rice or when you use a roux to thicken a liquid. The science behind that is that the starches reach 150 degrees Fahrenheit and they absorb liquid and then they swell. And these swelling molecules is what makes your rice bigger. It's what makes your pasta bigger than the dry pasta. It's what uh, makes... Um, uh, anything that you steam, uh, sauces, makes your sauces thicker because the starch, the flour, the cornstarch, the arrowroot, the, the, anything that you're using to thicken absorbs the liquid and swells. Okay, that's the basic idea behind gelatiniz gelatinization of starches. What's that got to do with our wet or dry chicken? Nothing. Okay, so <laughs> we move on. The next is coagulation of proteins. At 165 degrees Fahrenheit or about 74 degrees Celsius, proteins coagulate. They stiffen and shrink. You know this if you 
you've ever made a hamburger. The raw hamburger is twice as big as the cooked hamburger, right? Things stiffen and shrink. They lose moisture, which is the next of the four effects of heat on food, is the evaporation of moisture. At 100 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, moisture evaporates. It enters the atmosphere as steam and your items dry out. The fourth effect of heat on food is at 320 degrees Fahrenheit, 160 Celsius, caramelization of sugars. Sugars caramelize, they turn brown, they get brittle. You know this if you've ever made toast. Okay, that's the background information. As you can tell, I'm a little practiced <laughs> at going down that list of things. That's the background that you need to know. So when we cook by method, imagine taking a wet chicken, putting it in an oven in an indirect convective dry cooking process and what happens as you go through the effects of heat on food gelatinization of starches there really isn't much starch there unless you're cooking rice in it as well uh, evaporation of moisture next thing that happens so that wet chicken fills the oven with steam fills the oven with moisture as the proteins continue to coagulate stiffen and get cooked more and more and more and at some point at 165 degrees your chicken is fully cooked it's done it's safe internal temperature with your thermometer but we haven't gotten anywhere near the 320 degrees yet why because of all that steam in the oven, all of that moisture in the oven. So what happens when you finally get to 320 degrees? And this is what people tell me, I cooked it long enough so that it browned. You cooked it long enough so that it's gonna taste like a tennis ball that is browned. Because all that time in that temperature danger zone, all that time coagulating the proteins, waiting for that thing ultimately not to brown, but to run out of steam literally run out of steam. So this bland chicken here, when it finally runs out of steam and all the moisture is evaporated and it's all gone, it's fully cooked a long time ago, that's when it can start browning. So in your oven in moisture, you are never gonna get a browned item. The, the, the item, is, it's the arch enemy of brown and crispy, moisture in your oven. But let me ask you this, how come grilled chicken looks like that? You could put your, your chicken in the oven for two hours with moisture and it'll never get brown. Chicken on a grill, on a barbecue grill, gets browned in the first five minutes. Why? Conduction versus convection. Wet versus dry, right? We've done this. In web cooking classes in week four, we talk about open barbecue grill lid or closed barbecue grill lid. Open lid is single source conductive heat from the bottom. Closed grill lid is convective heat surrounding it. It's more like an oven. So this has so much to do with direct or indirect heat, dry or moist heat. You can never expect something to get brown and crispy when you're poaching it or simmering it or steaming it. And if you think just because you're putting it in the oven under an indirect convective dry process, it doesn't mean that your oven is dry. If your chicken is wet, then your oven is wet and that will never get things caramelized. So everybody asking me how to make browner this and this and this and this, the first step is making sure it's as dry as possible. Look, this is just like um, when I do Brussels sprouts. Here's my best uh, example for Brussels sprouts. I always hated Brussels sprouts. Terrible, nasty little baby cabbages, right? They stink. Because most of the time, my mom, or when I've had them in the past, I've steamed them. Indirect, moist heat. Something that's steamed, has no color. It's a little, it's a little chewy. It's a lot stinky with Brussels sprouts. So what I've stopped doing is using my steamer basket here and using that indirect moist heat. What I'll do is I'll steam the Brussels sprouts first, drain them, chill them, dry them completely, and then apply dry conductive heat in a saute pan and brown them. This way I have a Brussels sprout that's really soft in the middle because of the indirect moist heat that does a good job with that. And then when I put them in the saute pan with some butter or olive oil, um, I like nut oils, a walnut oil or a sesame oil with Brussels sprouts. Um, then I do the dry direct conductive heat and I wind up with this really nice dish. Now I love Brussels sprouts. Not because the Brussels sprouts got any different, not because I got any different, but because I found a new combination cooking method. Using that moisture to my advantage to soften them, I don't want them brown at that point, 
and then to put them in the saute pan. It's just like when I do my floppy chips. Um, years ago, I lived in Columbia, South Carolina, and there was a wing place that made floppy, they called them floppy chips because half of them were kind of crispy and half of them were still floppy. They were homemade potato chips, but it's the same thing. When I slice my chips, my potatoes on a mandolin, the next thing I have to do is lay them on paper towels and pat them dry. And this creates a problem for laundry day. Trust me, because I got to go through three or four paper towels, but I'm never going to get a crispy chip. Once I dry them, I uh, douse them in olive oil, toss them all around right before they go on a screaming hot sheet pan. They get a bunch of salt, again, heating the pan first. There we go. And they come out as some of them really nice and crispy. Some of them still a little floppy, but the entire key to making your own potato chips in a dry convective oven again, is the moisture, is eliminating the moisture from it. So the, the enemy of brown and crispy, plain and simple, is wet and soggy. <laughs> the two of them are opposite ends of the spectrum. So anytime we're looking at making things drier, this is what you, making things browner, this is what you can do. Dry it first or change the heat so source from indirect to direct, right? Think about the difference between putting something in the oven and putting it under the broiler. Think about the difference between putting it in the oven and putting it on the grill. Indirect versus direct is how you can control the heat there. So now that we all have identified the enemy of dry and crispy, uh, brown and crispy, uh, you can start putting that into use in your own kitchen, right? Eloisa says, yum, yum, yummy. That's good. I'm making Ola hungry. I like that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rhonda is asking about lid up or lid down. This is the question that we pose in web cooking classes. Again, what do you want your end result to be? Lid up is single source conductive dry. Lid down is single source convective surrounding it dry. If you add a, po a pan of moisture in the bottom, like we often do with fish, then you have moist convective. If you add a pan for smoke, then you have indirect smoking convective. See, when you start to think, and this is why we have our community, because I want us all to think very similarly. I want us to think about the application of heat more than following the recipe. That's the idea, Rhonda. Uh, do, 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 do. Rachel's with us. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel always says nice things to me. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Maria is with us from Canada. That's good. Eloisa from Baja, California. Dave McCoy joins us. I'm looking for questions right now. Uh, Mama Neil is with us. Ah, oh, warms my heart all the time. Mama Neil, you and I have been together for almost a decade now, Mama Neil, haven't we? She's one of the very first to take web cooking classes, and boy, she does a great job. Ah, Kevin Murray has the answer. <laughs> We've been talking about who that character was. Yes, it's Snidely Whiplash. And for all my Canadian friends, um, Dudley Do-Right was his nemesis and Bullwinkle the Moose. So everyone that has uh, identified Snidely Whiplash correctly, that's, for, that's great. That's hysterical. That's good. Uh, so, uh, oh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about today, what an amazing question. Somebody wrote me this week and said, Chef Todd, and I know that this is an issue, but I've never really... Uh, uh, hi, Michael. Michael's joining us as well. Rachel is here. Rachel remembers Muttley. Muttley had a like, <laughs> like a whiny la laugh. Is that right? If we grew up in the 60s and the 70s together watching those cartoons. Uh, I got a, a question <laughs> this week. There's always a tangent, you know? That's why it's just talk live. Uh, so a question this week that I realize is, is more of a problem than I've ever addressed before. Um, and this was a question that gave me pause that I really had to think about for for overnight and then more so. Someone wrote me, and I know this happens with diabetes. I know this happens with some medications. I know this happens with cancer treatment. There was a person that wrote me that said that they have always been a really good cook. They enjoy cooking, but through some turn of health, they've lost their sense of taste. And they want to be able to cook for other people, but how can they do that if they can't judge how the item tastes in the end? This is like cooking roulette. Right? I mean, when they say, you know, people eat with their eyes, sure, but you don't season with your eyes. Um, and, and this is a question that runs all over me all the time when people ask me, 
Should it be a quarter teaspoon of basil or half a teaspoon of basil? How strong is the basil? You know, we don't know. There's a variable there. So when you get down to what I call the artist's final signature on their dish, the application of herbs and spices, the, the difference between skillfully seasoning a dish and over flavoring it, knowing when to use spices, when to use herbs, when to add them in the cooking. If you can't taste, this is all lost. So what would you tell someone? As a culinary educator, as the leader of a movement of hundreds of thousands of people, I wanted to just go, I don't know. <laughs> you know I, honestly, I wanted to go, oh my God, that is too big a hurdle to ever overcome. Even Chef Todd can't answer that question. So, hate it for you. But that would be lousy. <laughs> I would never do that to someone. They, they put their trust in me. They, they need some help. They want to know. And that's what I'm here for. So, I've reached out to some other people. I've, I've had some discussion among our chef friends and chef community. What, what would you tell someone like that? And the, the consensus was something I think is really brilliant. Um, I won't take 100% of the credit for it, but ultimately it comes down to this, all right? And you know how to cook if you don't have any taste buds, right? So we all know about the senses uh, on your tongue, and I've done classes about this. To me, it's like a teeter-totter. They, the opposite sides of the tongue go back and forth like this. You can't have sour and salty at the same time. I mean, I guess you can, but they, they negate each other. They balance each other. But look, if you don't even have the ability to do this balance anymore, how do you communicate to your diners? How do you know when it's good or not? So this was the first thing that came out of my chef mastermind was cooking methods. <laughs> Maybe not a surprise to you, but cook the item well cook the item correctly. And the, the agreement that we all came to is if you do a lousy job of cooking a chicken breast, but then, you know, kill it with seasonings, you're only hiding bad cooking. You're adding, you're flavoring the item to ha hide your bad methods. But look, if you cooked a chicken breast really well, and now we've been talking about direct and indirect heat, moist and dry. Let's say you've grilled a chicken breast really, really well. Imagine the flavor, no salt, no pepper, no seasoning, no nothing. It's just chicken. And you can remember what chicken tastes like, even if you've lost your sense of taste, but you cook it really well. I think it's almost a benefit. You know, I don't, I don't want to belittle this because, because it's a thing, but look, there are blind painters, right? There are deaf musicians. Ask Mozart. There are people that have overcome hardships and adversities that you would think they would never be able to do what they do. One-legged mountain climbers, right? People with no arms composing music. People are overcoming things everywhere. So this is something that can be overcome for sure. And it's almost an advantage because it gets you to go back to basics. So the answer we came up with is number one, cooking methods. Cook that chicken breast well. Make it taste more like chicken than any other chicken breast that's ever been chickened because it's been hidden by spices. And then number two, you, you know, you lose that ethnic profile thing. If you wanted to make Italian chicken, you lose the oregano, basil, garlic that you really need to communicate Italian. So you would put salt and pepper on the table, right? You would let people season with salt and pepper. Why not put the dry oregano or fresh minced oregano, dry oregano, dry basil, dried garlic. Why not put it on the table with the salt and pepper? If, if this is hindering your, your cooking and you're afraid that your seasoning can't be trusted because you can't taste it yourself, let them do it. Let them do it. So cook the item as a basic principle, the best way you can, using the methods, watching for your four effects of heat on food, using your thom thermometer for precise internal temperature, getting rid of the moisture to make sure it's brown and, and has a beautiful plate appeal to it, and then let them take over for the seasoning. So have no fear, you know, if you have, uh, uh, keep it simple. If you have suffered something that you think is going to uh, hinder your expression of your art, whether you're a painter, whether you're a musician, no matter what it is that you love to do, my advice is keep it simple. 
take it down to the to the very basis of things and let everybody else then season for you. Let everybody else add that final signature at the end. When you keep it simple, you return to the methods. You return to the basis of steamed uh, green beans. Let them put butter or salt on it. Cooked chicken, cooked pork correctly, let them season it in the, in the end. That's the way to do it. Keep it simple is the way to go about it. Uh, so, hey, what's going on in our, oh yeah, don't mound things up with spices. That's why that's there as well. Keep it simple. Uh, so, hey, what's going on in our Carefree Cooks community this week? Uh, we've been talking about wings. We've been talking about dry and wet. And one of the first things comes from Daniel Lee. So this kind of proves my point. Daniel posted in our community about how he was disappointed in his chicken wings. They stuck to the pan. They were really kind of soggy and, and gooey. Um, how can I make them crispy and brown? Just like we were talking about today. Well, the problem was Daniel sauced the wings first. He tossed them in the sauce and then he put them in the oven. Well, the sauce is moisture, right? So he filled the oven with moisture, but we've learned that today and Daniel's gonna give it a, a second try. Uh, Denise, whoops, there we go. Uh, Denise did some wings for a kid's party and called them pterodactyl wings. I thought that was really cute. The deviled eggs uh, became dino deviled eggs. A and it brings up a really good point. Maybe this is a good class for the future. Um, signage, w when you do a buffet or something like that, signage, telling people what they are eating is really, really important. And it gives you a little sense of marketing as well. You can make pterodactyl wings. Nicely done, Denise. Uh, James is doing St. Louis ribs. This is a great example of direct and indirect, dry and moist cooking. Ribs are the perfect example. When I do my ribs, I generally steam them or poach them in beer first, render a lot of the fat, get that uh, moisture in there, and then I'll take them to the grill for dry, conductive heat. So again, another good example of using indirect moist and then direct dry to come out with something great. The thing I loved about James Ribs is he made his own sauce. You ready for this? Apple jelly, honey, and his homemade spicy vinegar sauce. Everybody is going to be copying that. <laughs> now James copying that. Apple jelly, honey, and, and a spicy vinegar sauce. Great barbecue sauce idea. That's great. Uh, Gwen is dealing with comfort food this week. Uh, a typical Australian uh, winter, right? Winter's coming to an end for all my friends down under. Coming our way here in the, in the U.S. Uh, but Gwen is doing a slow-cooked lamb shank. Another great example of dry, moist, indirect, direct. So a braising example, uh, the Italians do asabuco. Brown the lamb shank, uh, the veal shank first in under direct heat. Get it all brown, render the fat, and then you add acidic ingredients, usually tomato paste, red wine, which will tender the item over a long period. So you start out with direct dry conductive, you finish with moist convective. Another example of being able to cook something. And this, man, this looks delicious. Wouldn't you want to just mop up that sauce with some bread? Nice job, Gwen, down under. Uh, Kathy's doing a Thai chicken Buddha bowl. Hey, I don't want everybody to think that it's all about about meat here, okay? We've got tons of vegans, tons of vegetarians in our Carefree Cooks community, and we make healthy food too, okay? It's not all about slabs of meat here. Uh, Kathy's uh, uh, did her chicken, and she poached the chicken because maybe it's not as important for the, the grill marks or for it to be brown mixed up in a Buddha bowl. Uh, she made a peanut sauce, put it over jasmine rice. That's great. Knife skills in our Carefree Cooks community this week also. James did a ratatouille, but this I loved this so much because anytime I think about a ratatouille, I think about square uh, eggplant, square vegetables. Dale did them sliced and then like shuffled them like cards and then baked it. What a cool presentation, right? A sliced ratatouille as well. And uh, Don Traub has uh, been working with the fish lately. And one of the things that amazed me, Don posted a before and after. Don's one of our very first members, Carefree Cooks, which will be having our third uh, anniversary at the end of this week, by the way. Don is posting his memories from a year ago, two years ago, the things that he started out as a Carefree Cook, and he's posting his plates now. Look at this plate. What a beautiful from a restaurant plate. And what impresses me is because the topic today is brown and controlling heat. 
Look at that fish, you know? Look how beautifully brown it is on top, but so moist and white and tender below. That's somebody that can control the heat in a direct, indirect, dry and moist fashion. That's the way we're doing it out there. Uh, what's everybody else talking to me about today? Uh, let's see, let me refresh this page. I'm staring right into my lights here. All right, <laughs> let me refresh the page so I can see all your comments. Boy, we're really going long again, uh, over 30 minutes, but that's good, we have fun. Uh, somebody said the word knife and Don came out, kind of like Beetlejuice, he's here. <laughs> um, oh, the comments move too fast. I hate them in the middle of reading. Uh, Cajun chicken Alfredo. Nice, Allison. I like it. That's a, a, a blend. You can make your basic bechamel sauce, right? Your basic white sauce. Put a little tomato paste in it. Make it pink. Then add some spicy ingredients, right? That's a, a Cajun Alfredo. I love it. Great idea. Uh, Barbara's asking, will she be able to see the video again? Yes. Give it five, 10 minutes. Facebook processes it, but then the replay is up forever. Um, uh, Eloisa loves ribs. Want to know how to cook it? Just like we're talking about today, Eloisa. You start wet, moist steam, make them tender, acid, then dry, direct, and brown them up. But we got plenty of things like that in uh, web cooking classes to teach you that. Um, I have to start over. Yeah, we'll talk about signage in the future, Rachel. That's, and I think in our Carefree Cooks community, there is a presentation webinar. We have 17 Carefree Cooks exclusive webinar workshops in our community. Um, so when you go to the pinned post in, in Carefree Cooks, underneath that, you'll find a presentation and plating. I think we talk about signage in there, but I'll, we'll bring that up on a Tuesday Talk Live again. Okay, I'm looking for questions. Uh, Cheryl likes the idea of placing seasonings on the table. Yeah, yeah. You know, you give up a little bit of that responsibility, but I, I'd rather admit, like, I'm not comfortable with the, the way I'm tasting things and let everybody do it to their liking, you know? Oh, Beethoven, not Mozart. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Helene. Thank you, Kevin. One of those guys. My classical music education. Yes, Beethoven. And of course it was uh, Picasso that cut his ear off, right? No, I know that one, that was Van Gogh. Uh, uh, cooking for someone who eats different foods than I do, can't try the food. Oh, that's interesting, like if someone's, if you're on a special diet, if you're excluding foods on your diet, but you have to cook for someone that eats those foods, same type of thing, you can't taste it. It's not that you have a, you know, necessarily can't taste problem, but that's a very good point. If you're cooking on a special diet or someone on a special diet, the same type of thing, let them season, you know? Uh, Padrino's asking me when to test adding herbs. Uh, herbs are leafy vegetables, <laughs> are leafy. They're very tender, they contain active oils. Herbs always go at the very end of a dish. If you try and add leafy vegetables, leafy things, leafy, leafy basil to a stew, forget it. An hour later, it's gone. So Padrino, uh, herbs, fresh herbs, always late, dried spices, always early. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, Kevin's talking about salt. Uh, if you got to take salt out of your diet, the best thing to replace salt is citrus or acid. A little bit of lemon juice, a dash or two of white vinegar, uh, get into uh, gourmet vinegars, balsamic vinegars, things like that. That's the best way to replace salt. Uh, Guy is asking about whole wheat flour for a roux. Whole wheat flour does not have uh, the gluten that uh, white flour does. You cannot make a roux out of only whole wheat flour. You need some white fl flour in there as well. And baking too. You, you can't make a 100% whole wheat flour dough. You got to have some kind of gluten in there. Yeah, Carla says it shows our age that we watched those cartoons. That's true. Good, good. Let me check my other comment section here because we have people from everywhere. Uh, ah, Jane loves these sessions with Chef Todd. Thank you. Ah, Jesse joined us. Hey, Jesse, congratulations. 
Uh, you guys look great. Uh, Jane is with us. Have a great afternoon, Lynn is saying. Good. I think I got all the questions here. Hey, thanks so much for being with us. And if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, <laughs> if, when I keep talking about being a carefree cook, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's not a magic trick. Oh, the true false. Thanks for reminding me. False, everybody. False. Once you defrost something, as long as you keep it in the refrigerator, as long as you keep it out of the temperature danger zone of uh, 40 to 140 Fahrenheit, uh, as long as you keep it out of that danger zone. So if you have 12 chicken breasts that are frozen and you defrost them all, use four, as long as they're still cold, as long as they're still in your refrigerator, as long as they're 40 Fahrenheit or below, you can then refreeze them. Now, they're gonna degrade because the ice crystals, the water is gonna form ice crystals and expand, it breaks down the muscle a little bit. It's not gonna be as good, but people are always telling me how the, the somehow the food is dangerous if you defrost it and then refrost it. That's absolutely untrue. So look, if you want to become a carefree cook like the rest of us, there's a journey that you can take to get there. It's not a magic trick. Uh, it's something that you can do, but you're going to reach a fork in the road at each time, and you're going to have a choice to make. My guidebook, The Five Forks to Carefree Cooking, will make sure that you make the right choice each time and be a carefree cook like the rest of us. Thanks so much, everyone, for being with me. Uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday for Tuesday Talk Live. Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. See ya.